Good morning and welcome to Let's Talk Truth. We are continuing in our little series of complete love and I'm so excited about it because I don't know when we're going to end. There's so much in God's Word about love and so I'm just praying through each day and each week about what we're going to study and so we're continuing today on complete love. But let's pray before we get started. Father, thank you so much for this day that you've given us. It is amazing and lovely, Father. Lord, but nothing is as lovely as you are. Um, you've sent Christ for us, Lord, your word for us, your Holy Spirit, Lord. You're a good and faithful Father. So I pray, Lord, in your faithfulness that you would just quicken our hearts and our minds to understand what you would have for us this day as we read your word together and talk about it. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to go back to our first two key verses that really are the center of our focus as we read God's Word together on this complete love message. Deuteronomy 6, 5. You might have it memorized by now because we've read it so much. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And remember, heart is the most inner organ. And so you can think of it as like the most inner part of your being, okay? Loving Him with that, all of it, not part of it. And with all thy soul, it's a breathing creature. You and I are created by the Lord and we're breathing, okay? So all of our breath, when you think of this scripture, and with all thy might would be your diligence, your vehemence. And so when you're thinking about your might and your, your diligence doing things, you diligently love him with all of you, okay? So that is number one key scripture in this. On the flip side, we've been reading Revelations 3, 15 and 16 because when, when the Lord says all, He really does mean all, okay? So that's why we go over here and read what He also says about what is not all, okay? And we've been talking about this the whole time and each time we talk about this message, these first two passages that we're going to read, okay? Because we really need to get this deep within our being. Revelation 3, 15 and 16. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You see here, the Lord is saying, He would rather you be all cold or all hot. And when you are halfway and you have half cold and half hot, it makes Luke warm, okay? And just in the first scripture that we read, he wants all of us, right? All of us to be loving him, not partially. I love, and um, the director is not going to be happy with me, but anyways, there's next two scriptures in this, which leads us to the next passage that we're going to talk about. Kind of gives an idea what is tugging at this? Why can't we love the Lord with all of our being? What is the tug here? Why is he talking about lukewarmness? Okay, keep this passage up. Looking at verse 17 and 18, and it will kind of give you a picture of what is tugging for this all part that we are supposed to give to the Lord. Okay, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. You see here, the world's goods. Right here, these next two passages after the Lord is talking about, I wish you were either hot or or cold, all of one or the other, not a mixture. The next verse is just telling us that this is an idea of what is tugging at us. And it's a constant tug. Even when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, so he's talking to a church here, okay? And he's given opportunity for repentance in this passage and then other passages when he talks to the churches. So it gives us a picture, what is the big struggle with this all? I want to go to uh, 1 John, okay, 1 John 2, and you'll get an, an even a greater look, okay. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. 
Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I want to pause there before we read the rest. Think about this. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now, when we just read Revelation 3, 17 and 18, what was he talking about? Things, goods, riches, gold, right? So the Lord knows our struggle. He knows that there is this pull that we would elevate things of the world above Him. And this would be a good time for honest reflection about what you are elevating in your life. What is your focus in your life? What, what is your heart? How is it divided? Or is it completely on the Lord? Okay. Now, I know we have to think about things in the world because we, we live in homes and we drive cars and, and things like that. But the, what is consuming that we can't really say that I'm loving the Lord with all of myself, right? So he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You hear what he's saying? Church, he's saying that we don't love him if, the, if our focus and our love is on the things of the world. And that's a hard statement, but it's true. He, he wrote it, right? Verse 16 and 17. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You hear that? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. So much of our flesh lusts for other things, whether it be gluttony, um, whether it be uh, uh, overindulgence in um, anything, okay? Whether it be uh, sexual morality, things of the flesh that, that our flesh, these desires of our flesh, okay? These are things that in the world, for all that it is, all, he loves that big word, all, for all that is in the world, and he names it, the lust of the flesh, okay? And the lust of the eyes. I read not too long ago, I think it was a psalm, it was either a psalm or a proverb about wanton eyes. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, and I prayed, Lord, please don't let me have wanton eyes. We can look at something and we begin to covet that and we begin to want it. Our eyes, our eyes, he says, and the lust of the eyes, and it, whether it's um, a person or a thing, like how many of you have a shoe or a purse fetish? I do. I will just say that. And I might look at something, and, and I try not to look at it too long because then I might want it, right? I might have wanted eyes too long, and, I, and it might become a lust of the eyes as far as desire to have that, you know? And so I, I do like to look at things for fun, but we have to be careful that we are um, in line with the Lord and, and walking in His Spirit to help us keep a check, on this all situation and what can pull us away from all if our focus becomes too consumed with these things that he's listing here. Then he says, and the pride of life. Oh my goodness. How many of you are just so proud of your children? I am. I am. But if I focus too much on that, I, it becomes very worldly. If I'm just consumed with um, how proud I am of my children and I, I just begin to glory them instead of glory in the Father. What about um, our personal successes, right? Uh, whether it's our own personal or um, a colleague or a friend or a family member. If we are not in, careful, we'll be consumed by that, okay? And it begins to tug with this all that God has required of us. He's required us to love Him with all. And, but before you know it, have you ever had a thought, and if you think on it too long, you, you, you've drawn out a whole story or a long list, and, and before you know it, you've thought on that thing for hours and, and maybe another day or two, and it becomes very much that it's pulled you away from your elevating the Lord because the pride of life can cause us to glory in ourselves, to glory in other people, and not in the Father, all right? When we are loving God with our whole heart, all of it, okay, and all of our soul and all of our might, He is our focus, okay? He is number one. And I don't know about you, but it can be difficult to do this. And what has helped me in the mornings, right when I wake up, before I even get out of the bed, 
okay? Because chances are I want to have my coffee before I spend my time in prayer with the Lord where I'm sitting casually and reading His Word and listening to the Spirit teach me and writing what He's saying. That's what I do every day. But I'm not going to always do it right when I get up. Sometimes I have early appointments, okay? And I don't want to rush my time with the Lord. And I do sometimes because that's life. But in the mornings, the first thing I do, and I encourage you to do this because it sets my eyes and my focus on number one. I say, good morning, Lord. That's what I do. I wake up when I open my eyes and I say, good morning, Lord. And then I'll get out of bed. And it helps because we are flesh. We are humans. And, and we are going to tend to look. What's that song? Prone to wonder. What's that song that says that? We are prone to look and want and desire. And, and before we know it, if we do too long of that, then that all becomes half. We, then we become lukewarm. We don't have ourselves in check with this. So in the mornings, try this. Try the, asking the Lord A to help you. But number one, just saying, good morning, Lord. And it may help this world issue because we are in this world. We, we, it's in our face, okay? And so we have to have things that help us Keep our eye on the prize, okay? The kingdom of God for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. He said, it's not of the Father, but is of the world. I want to everything be of the Father. And I know you want to too. We just need little practical baby steps to help us because we're all just made of dust, um, prone to wonder, and we need help in this area. But he's given us very clear direction and he's very, given us very clear warnings of this so we need to be more mindful okay verse 17 and the world passeth away these things that we're wanting okay these successes on this earth um the pride of life these uh desires that we have um lust of the flesh lust of the eyes, all that's gonna die that's gonna go away dead forever forever he says and the world passeth away and the lust thereof, it'll be no more. I can't, glory to God, I can't wait, right? But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. See, <laughs> these things that we lust after in the world, when we're looking, we're living in the world, we're not of the world, and, but when we are living in it, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for all of our love to be on the Lord and not things or pride, right, or eyes to wonder. But he's saying here, it's a greater, greater, greater joy, okay? Greater, um, you know, the greater lust. I don't want to say greater lust, but when we think about what causes us to desire or lust after other things and, um, and what causes us to be prideful, what he's saying is that's going to go away. And what's to come, okay, what's to come is much greater. Can you think about, um, and I'll just relate it to me, you know, I got a new purse last year. I told you I had a purse fetish. Okay. I looked for several months probably um, before picking out the purse that I wanted someone else to buy me for Christmas. That was my sister. I always give her my list. But I don't really like the purse anymore. Okay. And that hasn't even been that long ago. Right. And so this is a temporal thing. The things that we lust ever are very, very temporal very temporal and they're not filling us up and it's and, and it's going to be really temporal when it all passes away but when we are being obedient to the father keeping our check keeping a check on our thoughts and our desires right and that we are walking in his will he says we're going to abide forever we'll never pass away and i'm telling you the prize in the kingdom is glorious we will never wish we didn't have it. We will never be annoyed by it. We will never say, oh, I want a new one. No, the kingdom of God is unfathomable as far as its glory. And that day is coming. And we who are doing the will of God, not those who are lusting, okay? Not those who are living worldly lives like what he said in Revelation 3. Those people in the church will not make it, okay? He's given a fair warning here, now, today, for us to turn away from this world, the desire of these goods, right? Because it's carrying us to pass away with them. They're going to pass away. People are going to pass away. But those, only those, but he that doeth the will of God will abide forever. 
He's not a man that he would lie. And this is very good news. To me, this is worth it if, if I look too much after something I want and the Lord quickens me and says, you know, uh, what about me up here? And, and gets my focus right. Because we're humans. We're going to, our eyes are going to wander in the places that, they're not always bad places, but, but they sometimes will get ahead of God. And he's saying, I want all of you. I don't want a partial you. It's every bit of you, all or nothing. He says, I want all or nothing. And that's what he expects. And that's what he's going to get. And he deserves it because he's worthy. He gave all of Jesus Christ, all of his only son, all of him, his whole entire body was sacrificed for you and me. Okay, So he's worthy of me giving him all of me and you, all of you, to the Lord. He is worthy of it. Go to John 12, 25, because then we see how this worldliness is, um, and it's, there's so many scriptures about it, gives another picture of what he's saying here, okay? John 12, 25. One of my favorite verses, by the way, in the Bible. And next week you have a treat because someone's going to come sing and we're going to talk about this verse even deeper. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. See, all the things we just read about in the other passages are talking about things of this world and what, what happens, right? And so he, Jesus is making this statement very clear here. See, this life in this world, if we love it, and, and I was there, I wrestled with this scripture a whole year and I'd already professed faith in Christ, but, you know, was learning what this really looked like. And, and this verse, literally, because I enjoyed life. I enjoyed all that this world had to offer. And you can bet I was going to go for it. Whatever it was that this wonderful American dream had to offer here, I was going for it. I loved it. And then I read this, and I was like, well, how can you not want me to love this life, Lord? I, I don't really understand because it's good. It's a good life. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm having fun, um, doing some good community service work, you know, in the community, building it and that sort of things with other organizations. And, and it was about just surrender, 100% all. That all, this is about, a, this is an all verse right here. Okay. This is an all or nothing verse, period. And we all have those moments where it's all or nothing for the Lord. And we need to know, have we given him all or nothing? Because he's saying, we're going to lose it. Okay, if we love this life that we're in, and, 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 and you have to question, like, what's wrong with that? I mean, who couldn't? I did. And so, but he's saying here, if you hate it in this world, see, I love how he adds in this world, like we've been talking about, all these, the world is so full of things and not the things of him, okay? When we hate this, because when we put him first and we know what's to come, all this stuff is nothing, okay? Nothing compared to him and his glory. He says, we're going to keep it. We're going to keep our life. Our life is determined by this all. Our eternal state is determined by this all because I can't see, I don't see it being a gray area here, folks. I, I can see it black and white. That he that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it into life eternal. The things of eternity, the things of the kingdom, the things of the Father, God, all of him, all of us, has to be number one. Number one. Let's go see what else Jesus talked about this number one. Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. The number one, okay? But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. 
This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is exactly what the Lord is telling us in Deuteronomy, this verse 37. But in the beginning of this section, when it says, But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, see, they just got through questioning him about resurrection and marriage. And so they were always trying to find a fault in Jesus. That was like their goal, right? And they never could. They never could. And so, so then they thought, well, we'll send a lawyer. You know how lawyers can word things in certain ways, right, to get the answer that they want because they're, they're really pulling here, right? And so they send a lawyer um, to ask this question, to tempt him, basically. And they're asking about the greatest commandment. You know, the, the Israelites to, were to follow a law, a certain law. And, and we've read some of those in Deuteronomy and other scriptures. And Jesus is summing them all up, every single one of them, into things. And it involves all of our love, okay? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. In other words, every bit of us, again, talking about this all, how important it is, he's not wanting hot or cold. He's not wanting half of you, half the world and half of the church going. He wants you to be all about him, whether you're in the church walls or outside the church walls, whether you're in school, whether you're in work. It needs to be all about him. Your mind can be set on everything that involves your life should be about the Lord. Not that you're all in full-time ministry. Not that you're all on the mission field 24-7. But your thoughts, your actions, your responses in this life of this world are not of this world. They're to be of Him because there's a teaching moment in every second of every day wherever you are. And He's placed you wherever you are to give Him glory by your words and by your actions and by your love. Look at what the next one says. He goes, that, that's the first and greatest commandment, this loving God with all of you. Okay? And then the second is likened to it, verse 39. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. See, when we have our hearts aligned right with the Lord and we have given Him all, we've like, I'm all yours, Lord. And, and He's going to, by His love, we're going to cause be caused to love Him because, see, we don't love Him because, but because he loved us first is what the scripture says. And it's right. I couldn't love someone I didn't know. He had to come and love me first. Then I understood this love for him. And now I can't help but to love him. And so for you. And because of that same love for him, and it's not like it's like, okay, I'm checking off this commandment of loving him. I'm checking off this commandment of loving my neighbor. No, it is a supernatural experience when we can love our neighbor because it's not in us any good. There's nothing good in us to love our neighbor outside of Jesus Christ. The love that he has had for us by shedding so much blood, so much, I mean, just horrific shedding for us. That kind of love, when it is in you and you have truly received that, this love becomes more natural because it's supernatural, because of who is in you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. See, all these things of the world will be tugging for part of us so that we would be either hot or cold. Uh, we were not either hot or cold, that we would be warm, that we have all of it kind of mixed up and meshed and morphing together, kind of like some of the holidays are morphed together with, you know, Greek uh, belief systems and different gods and stuff. But look, when we are set on the Lord and that we're loving him with all of us, then this loving our neighbor comes naturally it, it's not like they're asking for the checkoff list because they're used to checking off doing all of these laws right and they get the list but i'm telling you that if you're having a struggle loving your neighbor it may be because you're having a struggle loving god it may be because all of you is not loving god maybe you have sectioned off religion and world and maybe the the uh religion is hot or cold and the I don't know what would be the appropriate one to call it. And maybe the world is hot or cold. And, um, and maybe you're kind of mixing them all in, but it's not anything about love or relationship. It's all about 
this is, I'm checking it off kind of thing. And that's what they are looking for. But this is a supernatural experience. It causes us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And he says this, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. See, none of the laws, uh, it's not that they don't matter. All the laws matter because the Jewish people are still practicing this. But we in Christ, he has caused us because he has fulfilled the law. He has written the law in our hearts. It's caused us to have a mind on that. But see, these first two commandments, it's what counts. He's saying, in, at the end of the day, this is what matters. At the end of the day, when you go to bed tonight, did you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind or might? Okay, depending on which Old Testament, New Testament here. And at the end of the day, did you love your neighbor as yourself? AKA known as um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. When I do anything for anybody, I'm thinking, well, uh, I, I would want that done to me. Then why wouldn't I? Okay. So if, am I loving my neighbor the same as I'm loving myself? If I'm going to feed myself, why wouldn't I feed a neighbor? Right. If I love my body enough to um, nourish it, why wouldn't I want to love someone else to nourish it? If I love the Lord enough and love myself enough to spiritually feed me, why wouldn't I want to spiritually feed someone else? Okay, He's saying, love thy neighbor as thyself. This is complete love. See, he says, on these commandments hang all, all and complete, same thing, parallel together. On these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. And thank God for Jesus Christ who came to fulfill that. And by Him, in us, we can too. He's good. He's amazing. And I love this whole complete love because I hope it's, you know, stretching you to understand more where you are in your love for the Lord and your love for others because that's it. That's all that matters. At the end of the day, that's your test right there. Have I loved God with everything? Have I loved my neighbors myself? And I pray if you haven't and if you're not, that you will be encouraged to ask the Lord, how? Help me, Lord. And some of us struggle to understand what that looks like because of our earthly experiences. And so, but he wants to show us because he's a good, good father. And he's going to show us whatever we need to know because he doesn't want us to fail because it's for his namesake. He wants us to bring glory to his name. And if we're failing in that area, we're not bringing glory to his name. And that's why so many people don't want to be a Christian today. So I encourage you to love a little more completely and, um, and have grace. Um, baby steps are real, and it's okay. So uh, let's pray, and we'll end. Father, thank you so much for um, you didn't give half of Jesus to us. You gave them all to us, and I'm just praising you for it, Lord. And because of that, I hope that um, it encourages others, Lord, to um, really love you with everything and not just partially, not with an arm or a foot, um, but with everything like you did for us. And and you're worthy of it, Lord. And I thank you so much for that. Lord, I pray that you would give each one that has watched this today an opportunity to love their neighbor as ourself in in any way, Lord. And just even that they would ask you, what might that look like to my neighbor? I'm surprised the number of people that don't know their neighbors. Lord, I just want to say thank you for your word and thank you for teaching us. And we love you and we praise you in the holy, magnificent name of Jesus Christ. And just um, I pray for all the souls that don't know you that we would know you. We love you, Lord. Amen.